homegrown letters tonight. <coughs> You'll buy a pint with your letters. <laughs> 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 no tough questions, please. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So, uh, I know most of you, I think, but in case there's anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Michael G0POT. Um, if you've seen me present before, you know I move around a lot, but I'm trying to just record this tonight because I had a few friends who wanted to see it and they can't be here. So, I'm going to have a bash at recording it. So, I'm going to have to stay a little bit static, which is against all things that come natural to me. But so, over the last couple of years, I keep hearing about the ubiquity of radio and hearing about this Maxwell chap who apparently gave birth to it all or something like that. So the other day I was thinking back to when I started in amateur radio and I thought, you know, yeah, but, um, when I first started, um, you know, I watched TV, listened to medium wave. Um, we may have had a microwave. And although he probably didn't realise at the time, had a torch, or using electromagnetic waves. These days, electromagnetic waves seem to be a part of every part of my life. Wake up in the morning, my alarm clock is kept in time with some radio signal from somewhere. I don't actually know where. I wake up, I check my text on my GSM mobile phone. I get up and microwave my coffee, because I'm a bit... <laughs> I have a latte, do you know what I mean? Um, get on the internet to check the weather for the day. Wi-Fi, so I've got Wi-Fi in the house. Out to the car using my remote control. I've got a Land Rover, but it's still got a remote control. It's got all the mod cons, see? Maybe stick the... GPS on in the car, so a little bit of satellite work. Everything that I do seems to have a little bit of radio in it. Even checking the messages on my watch, it was just buzzing there just to remind me, um, using low energy Bluetooth. Radio is used in all sorts of ways now. So I thought to myself, do you know, I'm a radio amateur, maybe I should know who this Maxwell chap is and what these equations are that people keep talking about. So about a month ago, I started having a little bit of a read about it and committed to doing a presentation to share with you lovely people everything I'd find out. And now I've got to try and repeat some of it, <laughs> which is going to be a bit of a challenge. Now, it's true to say I'm not a mathematician. I'll be upfront about that. I have worn my mathematician's bow tie in an attempt to bamboozle you into thinking I might know what I'm talking about. Um, Maxwell's equations aren't just mathematics, they're describing an electromagnetic wave. So a little bit of physics in there. I know cop all about uh, physics, but um, I'm going to wear my lab coat just for this presentation to make it look like I am a, a consummate professional. There we go. And German accent as well. Yeah, yeah. That's as good, yeah. Um, and to try and keep you guys awake a little bit, because this is probably quite a dry subject, I've thrown in a little bit of history, and let's face it, with the beard, I look like a bit of a weirdy, beardy history professor, don't I? So, so we're going we're gonna to cover a few different things. What I hope tonight is to bring Maxwell's equations a little bit to life to explain in a practical way what they mean, but we'll also look at the equations themselves to try and demystify, because they look a bit tough. It's all mathematically speak. So they look a little bit tough. So we'll, we'll do our best to, um, to try and break that down to make it less frightening. So if anyone has any questions on the way through, please ask somebody else. Um, I will leave a bit of time at the end as well for questions if you, if you have any, but please just shout if you've got a question. So who was Maxwell? What are these equations that he's famous for? And why do we care? So Maxwell was born in Edinburgh in 1831. Let me just get a little timeline up. So dinosaurs down this end, jetpacks and hover cars up the other end. Here's lovely Mr. Maxwell, sporting a rather attractive beard, I, I think. Um, he was born uh, just between the Georgian and Victorian period. So I, I kind of have this mental picture of Georgian period being all about mathematical discoveries, people, there were great advancements made in mathematics during that period, which I guess built on the mathematics from the previous era and, and the previous one to that. But they kind of sit between Georgian and Victorian. Victorian to me is all about that exciting 
um, new age science, lots and lots of scientific discoveries being made at that time. Actually, he was born in the year that King William um, had his coronation. We don't have a William era. William didn't last very long. He was only in place for about seven years, I think. So we, we forget him and go straight from Georgian into, uh, into Victorian. So just to kind of set a bit of context, when Maxwell was alive, obviously there was no radio. Otherwise, he wouldn't have got to invent anything. So he lived at a time when there were no cars. There weren't even any bloody bicycles at this point. The very best you probably had was the old velocipede when he was a young man. The thing with um, wheels and you just push it along with your legs. You don't actually have any pedals. They're coming back into fashion. And they are coming back into fashion. <laughs> even the penny farthing or the ordinary didn't come along until the late 1800s. And I ride one of those. They're genius. Um, yeah, it was very much a time of um, horse and carriage and uh, using your legs. It's a time where... Um, who was it? Charles Darwin? Darwin? Darwin. Set sail from Portsmouth on the HMS Beagle. That's what was going on about then. The Bronte sisters were hot, if you were, you know, into your reading. Um, the likes of Jules Verne, later in Maxwell's life, would have been publishing some of the quality science fiction that came out during the uh, Victorian period. So, the one thing you'll notice while I go through my timeline, the timeline, I'm going to throw up some people that were involved. And um, although it's a bit weirdly coloured, you'll notice that the picture of Maxwell is actually a photograph. Now, photography hadn't been invented at the point when he was born. It came along during his lifetime. But he actually applied himself to quite a disparate number of subjects. He was, he was a clever chap. And he actually did quite a lot of work with colour photography. So why I've got a picture of him looking so awfully coloured in, I'm not quite sure. But So what you'll notice as we go along is everyone after Maxwell will have a photograph and everyone before him will have a drawing or an oil painting. So that just kind of sets him in time. So, as a young man, he was quite a bright lad. He was very good at not just reading, he, he, he had a bit of a passion. He wasn't maybe a conventional learner, but he had a real passion for, for reading and reading the work of others. But he didn't just read it, he understood it. He absorbed it and he could make links that maybe other people weren't making. He could critique it and where he thought necessary, he could adapt it or improve it. So he was quite a talented chap. And at the age of 14, he published his first paper. That's the kind of guy he was. At the age of 14, there's hope for you yet, young man. <laughs> you better work quick there, you haven't got long, yeah? <laughs> so at the age of 14, he published his first paper, which was um, a mechanical method for drawing curves. And I think he'd done something about having multiple foci and a way of using mechanical means for drawing curves. At the age of 14, he published that. Now, I don't know what you were doing at 14. I was probably doing something with curves. <laughs> no mathematics involved in that at all. So, <laughs> uh, so let's get these equations out. Let's see what it is that we're looking at. And um, before I do, let me just take a quote from um, Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge, who says, Maxwell's equations are a set of four equations that together with Lorentz's force law form the foundation of classical electromagnetism. There you go, called, form the foundation of electromagnetism. So let's get these, these beasts out. Whoa. First of all, you're thinking, hang on a minute, you just said there's four, there's, there's eight on here. That's not fair. Well, when Maxwell first published his equations, and I think it was in a paper called A Dynamic Theory of Electromagnetic Fields. I think there were actually more like 20 plus equations that he published. And over the years, um, the mathematicians that came after him um, applied more complicated calculus, shall we say, to reduce these down to the equations that we see here today. The likes of Hertz, um, Stokes, and uh, Heaviside did a lot of work to reduce them. They did a lot of work, but Maxwell still gets all the credit. Boom. Just shows you it's, uh, it's who comes up with the idea first. So let's just quickly on our timeline have a look at these guys. So 
is it Rudolf Hertz, um, Oliver Heaviside and Sir George Stokes, um, they did a lot of simplification of those formula. One of the things you'll notice actually as we go along, with the exception of Maxwell, who unfortunately died quite young, he was 48, just a bit younger than me from cancer, and um, Hertz, who died incredibly young, I think he was only 36, most of the people that we're going to meet tonight made it into their 70s or 80s. And when you consider starting at the 1700s, the expected, like your, your expected life length at birth in the 1700s was about 35. I think by the time you get up to the 1850s, it's still only about 45. Now, once you got past birth, it improves a bit. I think a lot of people died in infancy. But um, what it tells you is that either these guys were superbly well off and could afford uh, good health, or science, engineering, and mathematics makes for a long life. I'm not, not sure which it is. Interestingly, Heaviside, who made it into his 70s, died falling off a ladder. So what he was doing up a ladder at 74 or whatever, I've absolutely no idea. And <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, probably. Um, so let's, let's get back to our equations. So I said there was only four. Well, the thing is you can actually view, deliver these as either integral calculus or a differential calculus way of writing them. Don't worry, young man. It gets worse. No, so, so there's an integral form or a differential form. So if you Google it, this is what you'll see. Um, so... I think we probably need to go back to school a little bit before we start to learn a little bit about integration and differentiation. What do you say? Should you give that a go? <laughs> so I'm going to imagine that most of you are way over there on the right-hand side, yeah? Or you're like, like me and over here on the left-hand side still counting on your fingers. But I need to try and get us somewhere in the middle with a little bit of advanced calculus. So let's look at integral calculus or integration. Now, how many of you remember doing this at school? We've got a function. So I've got my graph with the x-axis and the y-axis. I've got a function where, where the value of x changes, changes the value of y. And I've drawn this, this lovely graph. Now, if this was, for instance, the x-axis with time and the y-axis was velocity, so speed in a certain direction, if we find the area under this curve, we get the distance you've travelled. So if we want to know the distance you've travelled between time A and time B, we need to calculate the area between those two red lines. And what we did when we were at school, probably, was divide that area up into rectangles and calculate the area of those rectangles and add them together. Nice and simple. Because we know the area of a rectangle is just width times height. But of course, it's not terribly accurate because some of these are above the line, some of them are below the line. There's a little bit of inaccuracy in there. Fine for a lot of stuff we do, but if you're sending a spacecraft to Mars, we all know what happens when you get that little bit of inaccuracy and it reaches the surface still travelling <coughs> at a thousand miles an hour. So, so, yes. so the idea of integration is it allows us to calculate areas under the curve very, very accurately. And essentially what it's doing is taking each of those rectangles and making them very, very thin until they approach a width of zero, and we just have lots of them, and then we add them all up. And as the width of each rectangle approaches zero, we find the exact area under the curve. That's what integration is doing. Very simple, we're just adding up lots of things to find, in this case, an area. That's integration. <laughs> Easy, I don't know why people say it's hard. Differential calculus, then. What's differentiation doing? Well, as the name kind of suggests, we're looking how one variable changes when another variable changes. So again, I've got my x and y axis. Again, if this is um, time on the x axis and velocity on the y axis, I've plotted my, my function. And what I want to do is find at the point A, how much does x change when y changes? Or vice versa, how much does y change when x changes. And by using differentiation, we can find what we call the gradient, the gradient of the curve. So if this is velocity and this is time, the gradient is acceleration. And if it's really steep, it's really fast, 
If it's flat, it's not accelerating. It might be moving, it might be static, but it's, it's not accelerating. And if it's a negative gradient going downhill, it's decelerating. So differentiation is simply looking how one variable changes compared to another. Simples, easy stuff. So, ready for some maths? <sighs> okay, well, while we're at school then, let's just, let's just stop for a second and see what we can remember about electricity and magnetism. Because these equations are going to describe electromagnetic waves. So what do we know about electricity and magnetism? I have here an atom. I'm sure you guys recognise this. Yeah, we won't split this one. It could be an awful bang. But um, So I've made a lithium isotope. Um, lithium has three protons, these lovely red ones with a big... They have a positive charge. And normal lithium has four neutrons, the grey ones. But if I put a fourth one on there, it would look like a handle. It would be a bit weird. So I've made an isotope of lithium with just three neutrons. That's perfectly legit. Centre of the atom is where most of the mass is, so that's, that's the core of my atom. And surrounding the atom, in classical physics, are my electrons. So we have three protons in the atom, we will have three electrons circulating it. Cir circulating it? Uh, that's not even a word, is it? Circulating. So in a classic model, the, these electrons swish around the core of the atom. Now, they don't all circle in the same plane. There's a concept of shells. So the electrons closest to the atom are in the first shell. Then if there's more atoms, you can have a second shell, a third shell, fourth shell, ad infinitum. The ones that are closer to the core of the atom are, are more closely bonded. So we've got a lovely pair here. <laughs> of, um, of atoms in this inner shell and, and there's laws about how many electrons you can have in each shell so the inner shell can only have two electrons so that means my outer shell must have a single electron orbiting up here and what we find about atoms is if you've got a um, an atom with a single electron in the outer shell it actually makes quite a good conductor so gold silver copper platinum should I hope all have a single electron in the outer shell. If they have pairs, they're more tightly bonded. It's hard, harder for them to, to move. So if we've got a, a single atom, single atom, a single electron in the outer shell of this atom, and we apply some force to it, we can get it to move. So if this atom is part of a wire, and I put a voltage across it, we can force the electrons to move. And, and there's different classical approaches to this. Some people think of a battery as pushing an electron in one end and then the electron at the other end pops out I can't do a pop there you go and the electron pops out I like to think of it the other way I like to think of the battery sucking an electron out of one end and then the atom at the end of the wire hasn't got uh, is missing an electron so it's <coughs> it's more positively charged and then this outer electron on this atom thinks you're quite a hot looking, but actually that, that next atom is looking much more attractive and it moves across. And as a result, we get that chain reaction, that motion of electrons, that movement of charge, which causes current. So this is what we know as current. And if we, if we cut our wire through, no, if we cut the wire, nothing will flow, will it? We know current doesn't flow if you cut the wire. If you imagine a you've cut through the wire, you've got a surface through the wire, and you count the electrons passing over that surface, when you see 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons pass over that surface, in one second, we say we've got a current of one amp. Similarly, 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons form a coulomb of charge. Okay? So... Let me just quickly, so I've mentioned Ampere and Coulomb, and I just wanted to put those on. So Ampere and Coulomb are very much in the oil painting period of our, our, our timeline. 
Um, Andre Marie Ampere, um, born in 1775, um, sadly died of pneumonia. That was uh, prevalent of the time, I think. And Charles Augustin de Coulomb, um, who actually died at 70. He's, he's one of the earliest people that we'll meet on our graph. Um, and I think he was possibly knighted by uh, Napoleon as well. So um, he, he's, he's quite a, an old, old school chap. So Coulomb defined a law in respect to charges. And he said there are two types of charge. There are positive, fairly upbeat, yeah, world's good. And there are negative, a little bit down, a little bit pessimistic. And he said that unlike charges, attract. And they attract with a force that is proportional to the product of their charge. So if these are big charges, like footballs, they're going to hammer together. If they're small charges, like peas, there's not going to be so much force pulling them together. Also, not just proportional to the product of their charge, but also inversely proportional to the distance between them. So if I double the distance, I guess I'm quartering the, quartering the force. Yeah? Is my mask good? <laughs> you've, you've got to keep an eye on me just in case um, and they have a force between them that's known as the electric force that's my, my force line it doesn't, it's not just a single thing it'll be woo -hoo, it'll be curving between the two opposite charges and it's a vector do we remember what a vector is? We've got scalar and vector. So a scalar is something that just has magnitude, and a vector is something that has magnitude and direction. Yeah? So if, for instance, if I punch Norman in the face and ask him how much that hurts, that measure would be scalar. Quite a lot, Michael. <laughs> but the act of punching him is like a vector. It's got force and direction. So punching vector, pain, Scalar. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> so, that was current. The other thing to say about current, which I, is probably quite important, is it, it must flow in a loop. I said if you cut the wire, it, you, you, you're not going to get any current flow. And it's, it's pretty critical that where you have current flowing, it, it must be in a loop. Now, magnetism. A magnet is a dipole. It has a two poles, a north and a south. What happens if we break those in half? We get two dipoles. <laughs> yes. Now, I didn't actually research. I read somewhere that they thought that physicists thought that it might be possible to have a monopole, but I've not actually read to find out whether that's true or not. Do you know? So yeah, I'm pretty, it's, it's latest thinking. There's a so, lot of research going on, but I don't think they've discovered them yet. Right, mm -hmm. so it's still theoretical, yeah. yeah? Okay. So, from our point of view, um, a, 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 a magnet is a dipole. Um, and I think it was Gauss who said that the, the, the magnetic force, which we're probably used to seeing if you put um, a magnet under a piece of paper, sprinkle some iron filings on, and you get those lovely magnetic line force lines showing in the magnet in the iron filings magnetic force is a vector again and whose direction is a line along which the force acts and the magnetic force is inversely proportional to the distance so we get to the square of the distance so again the further you get away from this the less force it has critically any magnetic force, leave, force lines leaving one end of the, uh, of the magnet must return to the other end. There's none that just radiate into, radiate into space. They, they all, again, it's a closed loop. So, magnetism and electricity. So let's make a start. So Maxwell must have been quite a clever guy. Mustn't he come up with these four equations? demonstrating, wow, you're absolutely right, he didn't. This first one was actually a product of Gauss. 
Now I've got a feeling, Gags actually did the first two. I've got a feeling that Gags may not have actually published this. And that I, what I read was that Maxwell read Gags' notes, discovered this and published on his behalf and accredited Gags with the finding. So kudos to Maxwell for um, shouting out the work of another uh, mathematician. So Gags quickly on our <coughs> line. There he is, one of our oil paintings. And what an oil painting he is. <laughs> um, again, he did quite well. Lived to 77, died of a heart attack, but um, he does look like he probably had gout as well. Uh, he looks like he was living a good life. So, first two were actually discovered by Gauss. The next one, well, Maxwell had a little bit of an input here. So, he picked up on some work by Ampere. Um, and he <coughs> developed that. So you remember I said at the beginning, he was very good at reading and assessing other people's work and maybe developing it. And, and he developed Mac, uh, Ampere's um, basic principle, I think, in relation to what he read about the, the last equation. And the, quickly, Ampere, where's Ampere? Oh, there he is. <coughs> we already covered Ampere, I think, didn't we? Interestingly, 1775, Thomas Crapper, Patented the first flush toilet. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Um, the last equation was actually uh, discovered by Faraday. This is all about generators, dynamos. Um, and weirdly, um, Faraday published this and first experimentally demonstrated it in the year that Maxwell was born. So that just goes to show you the kind of order of events. So Maxwell came along, read this, and used it as part of his knowledge of all the other equations to predict electromagnetic waves. So, Faraday, we haven't took, looked at Faraday on the line yet. Let's, let's see where he is. Here we go. Faraday, he, he, Faraday really crosses from the Georgian to the Victorian, didn't he? He must have lived at quite an exciting time, seeing, seeing that transition into the Victorian period. Um, he was born the same year as Samuel Morse, little touch to uh, telecommunications there. And also, um, I think the year he was born, long distance communications using semaphore were first demonstrated in Paris. So the world was starting to become a smaller place and the idea of comms and using uh, electricity and, and visual means to do long distance communications was starting to uh, really be used in practical terms. So let's make a start on these equations then. So the first one, Gauss. Gauss said, the electric flux out of any closed surface is proportional to the total charge within the surface. What does that mean? What do we mean by surface as a starting point? Yeah, even that I don't understand. So I guess if you're measuring charge, it's quite hard to measure something like next to an electron because your, your electron's whizzing around, you can't actually see it. In practical terms, maybe you're looking at charge um, or electric flux at the outside of a cable, for instance. That might be your surface. This is going to be my surface, a paper bag. So, let me chuck a charge in there. So I've got a charge in a surface. And Gauss is saying the electric flux, we remember the electric flux, the electric field. I'm going to interchange the word flux and field. There's a, a slight difference, they're, they're subtly different, but in terms of what we're doing tonight, nothing. So an electric field is going to come out of that charge in that bag as a vector. It's seeing another charge down there and it's creating electric field lines. And basically what Gauss is saying is that the charge which is enclosed in that is related to oh, the electric field that we measure at the outside of this bag, on the surface of the bag. That's all he's saying here. So let's have a, let's quickly break this down. There's some weird symbology. Symbology? I'm making up a lot of words <laughs> I've obviously been doing a little bit of that. There's some weird symbols here. So, so what, what do they actually actually mean? 
stay boy. With this first symbol that looks like an elongated, elongated S is actually an elongated S. And it basically means sum. We're going to sum up some stuff. That's what integration's all about. It's all about adding together lots of things. The S basically means we're adding measures at a surface. I've got my charge in here with electric force lines coming out and I'm going to measure the magnitude of the, 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 the electric force at the surface of my bag. And that little ring in the middle of the S, that means a closed surface. I'm going to measure over the whole surface, not just a bit of it. So that's all that means. Taking measures over the entire area of my surface. What is it we're measuring? We're measuring the electric field in volts per metre. What's that lovely little arrow? Is it like mine? It basically means it's a vector. Punching, punching the moment. <coughs> so electric field is a vector. Now, the next bits look a bit weird. Dot and this N, N with a, a hat over it. What, what does that mean? Well, this is an integral calculus function that basically says we want to look at the part of the electric field that's parallel to the N hat. But what's the N, N hat? The N hat is the unit normal vector. What, is a, what does any of that mean? What, what does normal mean? So, yeah, 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 right, I'm hearing the right word. So, earlier on we said about the um, calculus and that tan I had that tangential line. We have a surface. When you draw a line parallel to that surface, it's, it's a tangent. But at 90 degrees to it, that's what's called the normal. So, with a ball, if you draw a line straight through it, eye to the surface, that's called normal to the surface. It's just a mathematical or physics term. So in this case, when I'm measuring my electric field at the surface of my bag, I'm measuring those that are at right angles to the surface. I'm looking at the proportion of that that's at right angles to the surface of my bag. That's all that means. DA. With D, it's just delta. It just means a little bit. And A is the area. <coughs> so what we're saying is, we're going to split our surface up. Well, hey, thank you, coming, man. We're going to split our surface up into lots of little areas. And we're basically going to measure the electric field at right angles to the surface at every single one of those little bits of area. And then we're going to add it all together. That's it. That's all that means. And what do we get when we do that? Well, naturally, it's proportional to the charge that's inside the surface, yeah? So I've got my charge in there. Q is our symbol for charge. And ENC just means enclosed. It's proportional but not equal to. And the constant of proportionality is this thing called epsilon. And epsilon is the permittivity. And the little zero means permittivity of free space, of a vacuum. What is permittivity? Permittivity is how easily um, an electric field can pass through space, basically. It's the resistance that free space, or the material that you're putting an uh, electric force through, how well it allows that electric force to pass. Think of a capacitor. Capacitor with a dielectric how well that allows charge to be created or stored. Are you assuming this is in free space? Yes. So we're not using any dielectric? So we're not using any dielectric. If you, if you used a dielectric, it wouldn't be epsilon naught, it would be epsilon, and it would be the epsilon for the material that you're in. Epsilon zero is basically um, a vacuum, but to be fair, if you measure the um, permittivity in this room, in this atmosphere, it's pretty close, I think, to that of a vacuum. It's, it's not that different. Steve's nodding, so I feel much, much better about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's not much in it, is there? 
Okay. Awful, not too bad. Are we sticking with me? Yeah? No one's, no one's shot to the bar to get around in yet, so um, I'm, I'm taking that as a good sign. Equation number two, another one of Gauss's. So this one is his law for magnetic fields. The net magnetic flux out of any closed surface is zero. Yeah, I kind of, does that make sense? So if I take the charge out and I take one of my magnets and I drop it inside my surface, my bag, we're obviously going to get magnetic flux, li flux lines. <laughs> Best watch how I say that. I nearly came out wrong. Um, we're going to get magnetic flux lines um, created from one pole to the other. And they're going to pass out. Some of them are going to be inside of the bag, but some of them are going to pass outside of the bag. And those have a direction. And where they're leaving, we might consider that to be positive. And where they're going back in, we might consider that to be negative. So out and in. And basically what Gauss is saying here is that if you add up all those positive outgoing lines with the negative ingoing lines, you'll have a net result of zero. All of the magnetic flux that leaves re-enters again. That's basically all that means. I don't know why you made such a big deal of it. To be honest, <laughs> it's simples. What is B? We're about to find out. Oh. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me. So remember this first bit? Big S, we're just adding up lots of stuff. S doesn't mean we're adding up lots of shh. It means we're adding up the measure to the surface, and it's a closed surface, we're measuring all of the flux coming out of all of the surface. This time, we're measuring the magnetic field. So B is the symbol we're using for magnetic field. If you Google these equations, you will come up with all sorts of things. People do use different, um, different letters for different things, but E and B are quite common in mathematics and physics, I think. Um, magnetic field measured in Teslas. Again, the arrow because it's a vector. And again, the dot in hat because we're measuring the magnetic flux normal to the surface, at right angles to the surface. The DA, a little bit, we're, me we're measuring it each little bit of the surface and then adding those all together. And we're saying basically, if we do that, it adds up to zero because all of the lines leaving return again. Easy, Gauss, I don't know why he made such a big fuss. It was all really simple. So let's have, we talked about um, Volta, volts, Volta and um, Teslas, so the magnetic field. So let's just have a quick look at them on our timeline. So Volta, here in 1745. Um, and interestingly, most of the SI units we have seem to be from the um, oil painting brigade, but Tesla was way out there. He was only born in the mid 1800s, just at the time that surgeons thought it might be a good idea to start washing their hands between surgeries. <laughs> Thank God he must have thought. Um, and he didn't die till nearly the end of the Second World War. Um, and in fact, <coughs> Tesla as an SI unit wasn't brought in until 1960, I don't think. So it's quite a recent um, unit of measurement. So let's go on to number three. Now, number three is going to be a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to start with what Ampere originally said, because it's a little bit easier to understand. So Ampere said... An electric current is accompanied by a magnetic field whose direction is at right angles to the current flow. An ampere had a right hand rule. God, all the mathematicians and physics of the time seem to have a right and left hand rule. It's really hard to keep up with them all. They're all doing something, pointing somewhere. But ampere had his own right hand rule. And his rule was, if you put a DC voltage across a wire and a current flows in the direction of my arrow, if you put your thumb in the direction of the, in the, direction of the uh, current flow, your hand curls round in the direction of the magnetic field that's created. So when you put a... He discovered, essentially, that when a current flows through a wire, 
you get a resulting magnetic field. And the direction it rotates around, if you're interested, is the way your fingers go around. So that was quite simple. What Maxwell did was extend that to think about a changing current. And he said a changing electric field is accompanied by a changing magnetic field at right angles to the change in electric field. So essentially what he's saying is, if my current's going that way, Ampere's right hand rule, the, the magnetic flux is going around the room that way. If we turn the current around, right hand rule, now the magnetic flux is going in the other direction. So an alternating electric field, and that electric field is, remember, being caused by these electrons moving. An alternating electric field is causing an alternating magnetic field. Now then, let's see if we can break this one down. So starting, I would say at the left-hand side of this, but it's so big I couldn't actually fit it on one line. So starting on the top deck, which would be the left-hand side of the equation. Basically, the left-hand side of the equation um, is describing the circulation of a magnetic field around a closed path. So do you remember, we kind of said with, with um, Ampere's uh, basic rule, where you have a wire, you put a current through it and you get a magnetic field around it like this. So what we're doing is treating that, that magnetic field that, as a flat, closed path. And we're going to measure the magnetic field around that. So rather than a surface, we now have the letter C indicating closed path. Again, we're measuring or seeing the magnetic field that's created, and it's a vector. And this time, because we're not doing, it's not area, because we're not doing a surface, it's length. So it's a small amount of the length of this continuous path that's going around my wire. A bit of path C. So that's the magnetic force. That's the magnetic flux that's flowing around the wire. And we said that is caused by a change of electric force, this flow of current in the wire. So the bottom part, the right-hand side of the equation, is actually describing the change of current. And I'll just put a little picture there to make it clear. We're measuring at this plane in the centre of the wire. So we've introduced a new coefficient, a new, a new uh, constant, this mu naught. Before we had epsilon, which was permittivity, that's how easily electric field can pass through space. Mu is permittivity, permeability, sorry, let me get that pronounced right, permeability. That's how easily a magnetic force can flow through space. And obviously, because we're creating a magnetic flux. And to create that, we need to have a flow of current, mm -hmm. and there are kind of two elements here. There are what are called the enclosed electric current. Now I think, I've pictured this as being basically a DC current element. And do you remember what we said with um, Ampere? If you put a DC current, you get a, a magnetic field created, mm -hmm. but it's static, that's it. Once it's established, the system is steady and it doesn't change but you may have a standard a static electric field created as part of your um, flow of current whereas the right hand side of this is looking at a change it's looking at the um, changing current and I don't know whether you can remember the first equation we looked at was this change in electric field equaled the charge divided by epsilon naught. And now we've brought the epsilon naught up and we're saying this is equivalent to the amount of charge, the change in charge you've got flowing. That one's a little bit harder. There we go. So that's the electric flux through the surface. And here we're talking about a surface like a piece of wire. And at this point, I've started thinking of what is happening a bit like a chain 
If you see pictures of this on the internet, what you'll see is uh, uh, something like an electric wave going up and down, and then a magnetic wave going side to side in series with each other. But to me, thinking about how this works, I'm thinking of a chain with links of a chain. So I've got a circular current flowing, creating a magnetic flux in a circle, which creates a current in a circle, which creates a magnetic flux in a circle. So I'm, I'm thinking of chain rather than um, the, the kind of classic picture of it. So that is Ampere's law as modified by Maxwell, and that's probably the hardest thing to I've had to understand. <laughs> the last one then is Faraday's law. And Faraday, and you can think, hang on a minute, haven't we just read this? Faraday said a changing magnetic field is accompanied by a changing electric field at right angles to the change in the magnetic field. It's basically the opposite of what we've just seen. So if you think about it, Ampere had been looking at currents, putting currents through wires and observing that you've got a magnetic field with putting the compass near it. <coughs> Faraday had been looking at generators. He was moving the magnet near a wire and discovering that that created a flow of current or a voltage. So it's pretty much exactly opposite to what Ampere and Maxwell had <coughs> stated. And here, the left-hand side of the equation is about the changing electric field that's created by changing the magnetic field. So again, we're going to be adding up loads of stuff. We're adding up the electric field. Electric field's a vector punching. And we're adding up the electric field over a, a, a closed circuit, not, not, a, not a surface this time. And that change in electric field is created by a change. So DDT, this is basically the change of magnetic field in respect to time. So we're saying the magnetic field is changing in respect to time. It's not static. If you just hold a magnet next to a wire, nothing will happen. You have to move the magnet to induce a change in electric field. You didn't mention the minus sign. Oh, the minus sign. You spotted that. <laughs> Sorry. The minus sign, um, I think, is where Lenz's law comes in, which I mentioned at the beginning. I think the entire Lenz's law is probably popped into that. Um, probably a little bit much for tonight. I've thought of this as being um, a little bit like... Uh, a generator rather than a motor. So rather than um, energizing a motor and, and creating it to turn, we're turning the motor to create electricity. If you know more about that, I'd love to hear more about it because I haven't got that far. That's, that's the limit. This is touching on the limit of what I've discovered. But yes, what I've read is the minus sign is a big thing in its own, own right. It is Lenz's law, isn't it? Which I'm not going to cover in any detail tonight at all. I mentioned it at the beginning, but... I think we've had enough. So, in the last two equations, what we've seen is Ampere and Maxwell say changing electric field forms a changing magnetic field, and Faraday says changing a magnetic field changes electric field, and Ampere says changing electric field changes a magnetic field, and changing magnetic field changes... Do you see where this is going? It's going on and on and on out into space. So this is essentially the creation and propagation of an electromagnetic wave. And it would seem that there is no bounds to how far that will go. As we have seen recently with the Voyager spacecraft passing out of the edge of our solar system. They're, they're still in radio contact with us. So, you guys still awake? <laughs> that was tough, wasn't it? So. I guess, in conclusion, if I were to relate this to a, a practical antenna, I think equation one is basically describing our physical antenna. We're putting RF into it, an electrical signal going backwards and forwards, alternating um, current, which creates this initial electric field. 
and then that initial electric field <coughs> creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field creates an electric field and there we have the propagation until it re reaches a receiving antenna which essentially that is then happening in reverse. Your electric field is creating a current flowing in your receiving antenna. Now, what we've seen is Maxwell didn't actually create any of these equations. Um, th this was done by, his, by, by the, the mathematicians before him. And he didn't actually practically demonstrate radio waves. That didn't happen till the mid-1880s, I think, with the likes of Hertz. I think Hertz did the first practical demonstrations. Now, there were other experiments going on, if you read around the subject, um, but I think mostly it was more inductive um, experimentation. So they could see that you could um, put a signal in one wire and receive it in another, but very close. So I think they were using induction rather than radio propagation. But yes, yeah, so it was left to, to people like Hertz 20 years after Maxwell first proposed the concept of a radio wave to actually practically demonstrate it. And then by the early 1900s, obviously, Marconi was doing full-on experiments um, trying to uh, communicate across the uh, Atlantic. We did actually predict the, the velocity of propagation of the speed of light. He did, yeah. And I couldn't quite understand how he got from this to that. The new Norton email, they, they, it drops out. They do, uh, yes, actually, um, mu naught e naught and speed of light are related, aren't they? But uh, how he made initially made that leap, I couldn't quite work out. That was, that, that was something else. Um, right, is that, that's probably about it, actually. I'm... <coughs> Is not the minus sign simply saying back EMF? Opposing. Essentially, yes. Yeah, because yeah, if, you, if you think about it, when you um, induce a voltage or, or when you put a, a magnetic flux um, through a wire, the current that's produced is trying to resist mm. the induced current. That's why I was thinking of it as being a genera um, an alternator rather than a, a kind of motor. So yes, I think it's to do with the fact that it's trying to resist the um, force that you're applying. But that was a little bit outside of my, my, my understanding at that point. <laughs> so, um, al along the way to do this, I've found some interesting introductions to, to Maxwell's equations, which I just wanted to quickly share with you. Um, for a really, really simplified introduction, I highly recommend the Maxwell's equations without the calculus, or the T as I would say, um, which was quite a nice basic introduction to the subject to give you a kind of grounding in practical terms what, what was actually being talked about. If you're a bit more of a student and really, really want to know the maths, then A Student's Guide to Maxwell's Equations by Daniel Flesch is excellent. It's a really, really good book, but you want to have your maths up to kind of that university calculus level before you throw yourself in there. Um, there's obviously lots and lots of resources about Maxwell himself as a, as a, as a young man and as a mathematician. He held some quite, um, uh, quite nice jobs in his lifetime, quite prestigious jobs in his lifetime, and uh, did a lot outside of what he's famous for here, um, both mathematics and, and physics. He was uh, very, very busy throughout his lifetime. But um, I guess from our point of view as radio amateurs, the most important thing he did was deliver the equations that described radio waves. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got any questions, I will do my very best to answer them.